Hello everybody, welcome to the ASMR episode of Latin Experience. I'm just kidding, we're not doing that. Well, at least we're not doing that today. But, um, just wanted to say Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, wanted to do an episode yesterday, I uh, actually wanted to do an episode a few days ago to have it ready, you know, in time for uh, New Year's Eve, maybe even before, and just life got in the way, so... It's, it is what it is. So just good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you're hearing this. Happy New Year. I hope 2023 is better to you than 2022 was. And even 2021 or 2020. It's been, it kind of just feels like it's all blended into one thing. I don't really feel like there's much of a difference in 2022 from 2020 other than you know, depending on where you were, there were lockdowns and, and COVID was raging. But it's kind of the last two years have just been more or less fallout from 2020. So I wanted to talk a little bit about 2022 um, predictions for 2023. Um, kind of want to just say the good and the bad of 2022, not just the bad, but the good, the bad, uh, the ugly, the indifferent, and talk about what to look forward to in 2023 and why I think 2023 will be better. I had a conversation uh, with my cousin the other day and he pointed out that three is a prime number. So 2023 is more than likely going to be totally different than 2020, 2021, and 2022 were. So I'm looking forward to that and hopefully you are too. And if not, start doing it now. Start looking forward to it because there's a lot that can be done. And I'm hoping that we you know, all figure out whatever we didn't figure out in 2022, because this year was something else. And like I said, I feel like it's been fallout from 2020 for a long time. So I don't know where, where everybody was at the time, but I'll kind of give my, you know, pandemic lockdown story. The, I was working down in, in Miami I was working for a federal government contract down there in Homestead Air Base, which was one of the best jobs I've ever had. Best paying, best group, like everything just was perfect. So I should have seen something coming. I was like five minutes away from the base. I could I could run or ride a bike to work if I wanted to. Uh, and when I say bike, I mean bicycle pedaling, you know, and... That was just a great setup, man. The environment was awesome. The people that I worked with were great. The mission was great. And we had just moved back to Miami. I hadn't lived there since I was a kid. I went to high school in Miami. Uh, That's where I met my wife. And there was a lot to it. It just was a completely different area. Like My one stipulation for moving back was that I didn't want to move back to the same neighborhood where I lived because it was... It was a, a really rough neighborhood, and I was like, my, that's my only rule. I just don't want to go back anywhere near that neighborhood, and we ended up living literally right there because I didn't recognize it. We lived in a community that looked, it was a completely different than it was before, and so basically, it was still the hood. It just was, <laughs> it was dressed up a little nicer, but we got stuck there, be, like, within a month, yeah, because we got there in... I think late December or early January, and then everything locked down in March. So, oh, December. Yeah, we got there in December, and then everything locked down in March. So we had just a couple of months, basically, to unpack before being trapped in this house. Now, we were fortunate because it was a four-bedroom house. Um, we had a nice backyard with a, you know, with a fire pit and lots of space. So we basically, you know... I had a good setup for being trapped there for a year, but anywhere you get stuck for a year will drive you nuts. I mean, so one of the things that we did to kind of break out of the monotony was like, you know, my kids are suddenly being homeschooled. I'm working from home and I would get up in the morning, you know, put my oldest in the car, get dressed, drive around the block. You know, he'd go off to his area to do the school and I'd go off in the Eh, you know, sometimes you got to do things to just get your mind in it. So rather than just sit in pajamas or just sit there, just wake up and, and try to get something done, like 
it was the motivation of getting dressed, like putting on a costume, you know, just going and going through the motions that you normally would and just trying to make it work. And, you know, unfortunately, by the end of the year, that that contract wasn't going to get renewed because the work wasn't feasible. We have to, you know, the type of work that I'm doing, you can't do from home, really. You have to be in an office. It's a secured location. It's just different. So that contract didn't last. And ultimately, we couldn't stay there. Um, It didn't make sense to stay there. Um, And then uh, my wife found out she was pregnant. And so I was like, oh, we're having another baby. I don't want another year, potentially, of us not being around, you know, my parents and whatnot and her parents and the kids being around their grandparents. So let's let's go be near them. And they live in Lakeland, so that's what we did. We went to Central Florida, and the kids get to be around their grandparents and and, um, even my grandma. So they have a great-grandmother, which is... You know, for me, it's an important experience because I grew up with my great-grandparents in my house. Like, they passed away when I was 15. So my entire, you know, childhood, I had my great-grandparents growing up in my home. So it it allowed for a different perspective. I had a lot of, you know, unique experiences with them. And I had so much in terms of there was an old-school mentality. There were all these traditions. And I, I... those things were brought about because they instilled them in my parents and my parents instilled them in me, but I got to see them and learn them directly from them. So I definitely want to touch on those traditions in this episode and, and some other things because they're, they're important. When everything goes away, we have, you know, we can fall back on traditions and, and it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, stringent. You don't have to like fall into a specific way of doing it, but those things, they unite us. There's something that like when you're gone and your kids can, you know, they can show their children or, or their friends or, or whoever is important in their lives. They can say, oh, you it's It's not just from, you know, in a familial bond or a parental bond. It could be with anybody. Like a few years ago, um, another cousin of mine, I have lots of cousins, but another cousin of mine pointed out that, uh, he wanted to get into like Twitch streaming and and some other stuff. And you know, we used to play games as as kids. And like you know, if we you know rented a game, yeah, used to go to a place and rent games. We'd rent them from either Blockbuster or Hollywood Video. And you know, you had to beat it in the time that you had the game. But and you'd get the games for a little bit longer than movies, I think. But what we would do is like we would play the game at like whoever's house we were at so if we were at my house we'd play the game try to beat it and if we didn't beat it we'd rent it again and then go over to to their house and 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 play it over the weekend and and that's what we we you know it was kind of a thing that we didn't know back then they it wasn't streaming it wasn't youtube there wasn't twitch so looking back it's like man we missed the mark we missed these opportunities you know that wasn't our generation so he was trying to get into that and he says i really think that in addition to just playing these games, it would be really cool if we were, you know, talking about certain issues or talking about our experiences while playing games. And then he came up with an idea and said, you know, when I'm gone, I want you to remember me in a different way. I don't, you know, like, you know, people have funerals and stuff like that. Instead, like, maybe on my birthday, play some game, play a game that I loved. Like, every year we should get together on a set day and, like, just play a game. Like, pick a game that we didn't beat back in the day, or maybe we did beat and beat it again. Like, I don't know, Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time, or, you know, something random, Metal Gear, Metal Gear Solid, Metal Gear Solid 2, something. And uh, he said, you know, one day when I'm gone, like, in remembrance of me, just, like, pick a game that I loved and, like, play that game, like, on my birthday or something. And I thought that was really profound. I thought that was a really, really cool idea. And it's like, what a way to celebrate someone's life by by doing something that you shared with them, something that you remembered with them and and doing that. That was really, really cool. And so I'm just putting that out there in the universe that, you know, maybe we need to just, in addition to celebrating the traditions that are bestowed upon us by society and our families, we should create new traditions. We should find some things that we that we love and that we share with our our friends and family and loved ones and create some traditions create some cool stuff and i think that would be 
you know, it's really beneficial going forward for everybody. Just make your own stuff up. You're not just beholden to everything that's been, you know, bequeathed to you. Like, here, this, just, you know, come up with something new. That's okay. And come and experiment. Take some, you know, do something weird. If it, if it works, cool, keep doing it. If it doesn't, then don't ever do it again. Um... <laughs> But yeah, traditions are important, and I think creating new traditions are important. Um, it also helps uh, like younger kids and, and other people who who maybe don't participate in the same traditions or maybe don't understand those those traditions. It helps them come up with something new, and they are, they're feeling a part of it. So they're just not given a tradition; they're helping craft one. So I think it's I think it's important. But in addition to that, let's. Um, I mean, I, I think that's a really good idea. I think I should probably do that immediately. Like, take an old system out, and, and maybe you just pick a different system at a time. Like, whether it's PC gaming or, you know, it's PlayStation, Xbox, Nintendo, an old system, one of the classic minis, or, you know, maybe you have one of the old, you know, the old gaming systems. Like, I actually have my old, you know, Nintendo Entertainment Center, the, the system, excuse me, the old NES um, I have my old Super NES, or if you're in Japan, Famicom. Like, I have my old system still. Uh, Sega Genesis. Uh, um, Sega, what is it? The uh, Sega Saturn. Um, the Jaguar from Atari. Um, I had a Turbo Graphics 16. I remember playing this game called Bonk about a caveman who would bop his head on the floor and knock all the things off. It was crazy, man. 16 bit games. It's crazy. But yeah, pick a system, man. Pick a memory, and and make that happen. And I'm I'm sure that would also translate to people watching that on stream or on Twitch and being like, "Wow, that's cool." But let's get into the craziness that is 2022, because I was pretty much just talking talking about how 2022 was basically just fallout from 2020 and 2021. It kind of just blended into one memory like even though it's been a few years it kind of just feels like a little bit more of the same maybe less 2022 than 2021 but it kind of just feels like fallout like the world ended in 2020 and we've all just been kind of like instead of it just being the absolute end it was just the beginning and you're, we're all just kind of living in armageddon now <laughs> like like this is the post-apocalyptic world this is the zombie apocalypse the zombies just are lame and you know it's not what we expected, but I'm, I wanted to talk about, and maybe I should just quickly talk about the major prediction that I have for 2023. Um, being that three is a prime number and 2023 is shaping up already to be an interesting year with some shakeups, there's been some really odd shakeups politically, there's been some odd shakeups culturally, like uh, here in the United States, like there's been a lot of strange stuff that have occurred in the last year that if you would have tried to say that a few years ago or predict these things, nobody would have believed you. Absolutely not. just wasn't going to happen. And so my biggest predictor for 2023, and, I, and again, I hope it's not true. I absolutely hope it's not true, but I just kind of am seeing that, is World War Three Now, is it something that we're going to call World War III? No. Scholars and people are going to argue about what we call it and what the label is and, you know, whatever. But what I mean is that the indicators and the environment politically on a global scale is so similar to what the world was like pre-World War I. Like, there is... A lot of people don't realize that World War I wasn't like the same at all as World War II. So I actually stood on the spot where World War I started. There's a plaque on the floor written in five different languages in Sarajevo, Bosnia, commemorating what's called the shot heard around the world. This is where the Archduke Franz Ferdinand of the Austro-Hungarian Empire was uh, murdered by um, a basically a terrorist group called the Black Hand. It was a, the guy who, who committed the act himself. was named Gavrilo Pritzip. Now, the story is fascinating because they ultimately planned the murder 
and he was supposed to go to like a like a bagel shop, and there was a parade, and so the, the archduke was riding in a him and his wife were riding in like a convertible, and they were supposed to pass by this bagel shop where Gavrilo Princip was waiting, right, and he would walk out with his gun, and then he was supposed to shoot the archduke and his wife in the car, assassinate them, and then you know bail or whatever. Well, when the motorcade comes and the car drives by, Gavrilo Princip walks outside, shoots, and misses. No one even notices that this happened. The parade keeps going. Gavrilo Princip put the guns back in his pocket, walks back into the bagel shop, and plays the whole thing off. Like, well, guess it didn't work. Now, you're like, oh, well, the, the assassination didn't happen. Well, the guy driving the car makes a wrong turn and has to loop back around the block, comes back up the same street. Gavrilo sees this opportunity and walks right outside and shoots the Archduke. And his wife, and then I, I don't know if he was he was arrested or if he was killed, but ultimately that was the the factor the, that murder that assassination caused the Austro-Hungarian Empire to go to war with the Ottoman Empire, and the rest of the world just kind of fell in line. Like I think all of the world leaders were like at a summit, like in Geneva or somewhere in Sweden. Like there was literally they were. And mind you, you know, news didn't travel as quickly back then. So they were all just hanging out together. And they get news that, hey, I think we're all going to war. So they're just there hanging out like, oh, crap. We've, we've literally got to go to war in a week after this little, uh, this little thing is done. So they, they do. And ultimately, it was just kind of a war of, uh, like, allegiances. Like, ah, well, you know, that's my buddy. And, and you attack my buddy. So I, I, I guess I got to attack you. And that's what it was. Nobody really wanted to go to war with each other. It was just the environment was building up to that. And one of the other big indicators was a pandemic right before. Like, the environment is just way too similar in a lot of senses. So uh, a lot of analysts said that if there was a World War III, what was going to happen was uh, it would be started by Russia invading either Ukraine or another former Soviet state. But Ukraine was the big one. And then there would be some trigger towards NATO. There would be another NATO, or at least a NATO state that would be then invaded or, or brought into it. And then several other states would force their hand. So, you know, there's a lot of people in the United States that don't really want to help Ukraine. There is a lot to do, and I think that it's it's a proxy war, and we definitely need to, you know, prevent russia from doing what they're doing and, and the united states has always backed the sovereignty of you know of sovereign nations especially when they're being invaded by a foreign power or you know a stronger power in this sense and in, well, in some senses and the environment and other shapes like you you look at um iran is supplying weapons to or iran rather iran is supplying weapons to um to russia and now you have a far right coalition in Israel. Now, you know there are certain people within the Israeli government, especially on the far right, that are are really, really looking forward to go to war with Iran, and uh, Iran is just waiting to go to war with with Israel. So that's building, and now there's a prime opportunity to make it not so much about. If they go to war individually, there's already a war happening somewhere else. So it kind of becomes one of these things where Israel f could force the hand and say, oh, well, we were attacked by Iran or we attacked Iran. And now the United States is forced to back Israel. And since Iran is aligned with Russia, it becomes this, you know, this massive scale um, global effort. Some people will say like the global war on terror was a World War Three. No, it was most of the United States just doing our thing and you know other there were small coalitions but i think like i want to say romania had like 30 people that's not that's not you know force on force you're talking about world war three would be force on force in multiple countries so force on force you know conventional warfare between russia and ukraine which is currently ongoing and then force on force conventional warfare between israel and iran and then the united states and either russia or you know you know, who knows China, but like the environment is definitely building towards that. You know, there's a, a significant rise of anti-Semitism in the United States. There's a significant rise of, you know, cultural clashes and, and it's, it's 
eerily similar to pre-World War I tensions in a lot of the same ways. And including, you know, the, the pandemic. I mean, a lot of people think it's over. COVID-19 is still, still around and it's still affecting a lot of people globally, especially in China. So the, the indicators and the factors are all there. It's just what does that picture look like? So unfortunately, that would be the bad news. I think that that, you know, there's a lot of people that would also suggest, you know, from a political standpoint, you know, going to war isn't necessarily bad for an incumbent president who wants to win that may have their seat threatened. Is that a good thing for the country? Is that a good thing for the world? No, probably not. Um, I would I would argue it's definitely not. But, you know, it these these games, these chess, you know, these chess matches are played in a way that doesn't think about, you know, the common people. So uh, people out there should be aware. Uh, everyday people should kind of be aware of where it's going. That doesn't mean panic. That doesn't mean freak out. That doesn't mean get scared and sell your crap. That means just be mindful and be prepared for what could come. Because if you're prepared, you can mitigate. But if you're unprepared, then you get sideblinded and you don't know what's coming. So, you know, do a little history research and, you know, look into what, what the political landscape globally was pre-World War One, and tell me if you agree with me or if you don't agree with me and you know, we'll go from there. But I don't want this to be a whole bad news segment because talking about pandemics and global wars, that's that's depressing. There should be all there's a lot of good things to look forward to in twenty twenty three. You know, maybe you know, we might hit a recession, but maybe the economy, you know, comes back. Maybe, you know, we see the rise of electric vehicles. Um, we just had a major breakthrough with fusion technology. So this is um, a nuclear weapon is uh, fission. So as you take, you split an atom. Fusion technology is when you take, you know, two atoms and combine them. And the interesting thing about that is that the energy that is expelled is less than the energy that's put, or excuse me, the energy that's expelled from the, the action is more than the energy put in to make it happen. So you have a surplus of energy. So these are all amazing things. Maybe we go to Mars. I mean, I'm, we're not going to go to Mars in 2023, but maybe we get some breakthroughs in technology and maybe we do some good stuff. So there's a lot to look forward into 2023, and we're going to definitely talk about that more in a little bit. Let's talk about movies. I love movies. That's like my, you know, that's my my art form of choice, my pastime. And you know, uh, 2022 was a strange one for movies. Um, uh, you know, the let's talk about box office. Okay, so like there's there's different rates for what a movie or like what the the landscape for movies is. The big thing that's that's happening right now in terms of theaters is that um, not a lot of people have a lot of faith in um, movies actually bringing out numbers. Like people aren't going to the movies that they they, they did the way that they did before. Um, you know, in the '90s and 2000s, you'd have much smaller films going to movies, and you know, you had films that if a certain actor was tied to it, like it was going to reach a certain amount of numbers. Like it just, even if it was good or didn't matter, like if it had this name, it was going to hit some, some, some points. And that's not a thing anymore. Like the, the only two uh, real movie stars left that can sell a movie on their name alone is Tom Cruise and, and Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. It's just the nature of the way things are and 2022 also kind of put a a hamper in that in a little bit like it it changed the landscape a little bit um we'll talk more about black adam but black adam was a film that was being uh made for you know it's been in the process for 15 years but like that that's something that this you know it's a passion project for for dwayne johnson for the rock that he's been working on um and it unfortunately didn't do what it was supposed to. Now, is that because of, um, like, you know, is it bad marketing? No, they paid for a decent amount of marketing. Was it because the movie wasn't good? No, I loved it. I thought it was good. Um, is it the greatest superhero movie ever? No. Did it do what it needed to do? Yes. Was it fun? Absolutely. It was a great time at the movies. I think the problem was that, one, the DC universe has been struggling. And with all the drama and everything that's surrounding Warner Brothers and what DC was doing, it already was working negatively for it and then in addition to that the movie wasn't it wasn't amazing it wasn't groundbreaking it didn't do anything different it was just good and it was a fun time in the movie theater but that's not going to carry the same weight that it was if that movie had been released in 2018 or 2019 it would have done a billion dollars it would have been outrageous but 
you know, now, it's just not going to have the same impact. So we'll get back to that because I'm definitely going to talk more about um, Black Adam because it's very personal for me because um, my son, uh, my son Eli, was in that movie. He actually played um, he played a prince in the um, I guess you could say it was, it was I thought it was going to be in the opening sequence because it happens early on, but it's actually not. It's in uh, a flashback sequence towards towards the end of the film that kind of gives um, Black Adam's origin, and so. It, not it's not spoiler, so I'm not gonna say it's spoiler warning because it's not really spoiler. But um, towards the end of the film, there's or or in this flashback scene, there's a pharaoh, and the, this is the time that Black Adam first shows his powers to this pharaoh. This is the guy who rules Kandak, and in this display of power, it has you know he walks right up to this guy on his throne, and surrounding him there are his uh, his many wives and his children. So my son is one of those children, one of the one of the, the prince of Kandak, and he's next you know, right next to him on the throne. So he was to the right of the king, um, or the, or the, you know, I guess the emperor or whatever. Um, he was to the right of him, but on screen, when you're looking at the throne and from the rock's perspective and from the audience perspective, he's on the left. So he's on the left hand side, um, you know, from the, from the king. And we had a lot of fun on set. I definitely want to talk about that at another time on, and more of the details on that because we, we had a really good time. Um, it's it's incredible. I'd worked with um, with The Rock before on on Rampage, and some of the folks that were there. He has he has cousins that he works with, and and people that that um, regularly work with him. And a few of those guys recognized me. One one of the guys was a military dude, and we had connected before on the set of Rampage. Um, and you know we had some common interests, obviously being in the military. And so he had recognized me. And then um, when he found out that he was like, "Oh, are you here?" I was like, "No, no, it's my son." He was like, "Your son?" And when I told him who he was, he was like, "Oh, that kid's awesome." Um, turns out, you know, my kid didn't want to like. He was hardworking. He really um, put in the effort that day. He he wasn't about like you know. There was a lot of kids who were maybe complaining and other things like. Um, it, it's it's hard work for for a child especially and and you know this during COVID and you know there's tests you know they got to do swabs of the nose and you got to do all these things and this kid took it like a champ man he was ready to work and the conditions they were up really high on set and there was flames um, for the set uh, in the in this throne room and so the heat rises so it's hot and these kids you know some of them were getting a little you know antsy and he he toughed it out man he was like. No, nah, I'm good. I, I want to push through this. Like he was, he was a trooper, and some of the other guys recognized it. Like, oh man, that kid's cool. So I, I was really proud of him, and and I'm glad that we shared that experience, and that the both the the first films that we both worked on um, were starring Dwayne Johnson. Like we both um, worked with DJ in, in that, and I, you know, I, I spoke with him on the set of Rampage. I made him laugh because I I put quotes from The Rock uh, on my on like my, my computer with uh, little sticky notes and he saw it and he was like what the hell is that and I was like hey man I'm sorry I'm a fan he's just like that's crazy and so I mean I they they keep him a little uh you know contained and plus whenever the in between takes he's going back to his gym and working out and posting stuff on Instagram so I didn't get a whole lot of interaction with him but I, I got some and um I, I I liked working with him and my, my son did too and I like all the people that he surrounds himself with, um, all of his, his family and friends, like they're all really, really cool people. And I'm, I'm so glad that I got to spend that time, you know, on the set because the other parents, uh, a lot of them are just kind of secluded in this area because, you know, they, it's just hard and they don't want people there. Maybe, you know, somebody pulls out a cell phone or freaking, you know, whip something up. So they, they try to keep those folks to the side. But because um, I had worked with them before and, and they, these guys knew me, they pulled me over. They're like, oh, no, he's, he's good. And so I was kind of hanging out with them back set as opposed to being in this secluded area. <laughs> so it's just, again, it's just one of those things that I'm very fortunate to have experienced. But anyway, let's talk about the, the let's talk about box office. Because like I said, box office is what draws this, right? So if your movie is making money, unfortunately, that's just the way the game goes. So I'm going to talk about some some things, some TV shows and films that I thought were great, uh, regardless of whatever it made. But these are the things that I, I just definitely want to highlight these films in terms of um, box office successes. And that usually means that the lower the budget, the film, and then higher the return, right? So first off is Smile, which is a horror movie, right? I, I didn't even know this thing existed, and maybe that's because of marketing. They spent like what 40 40 million dollars on this thing and it made 400 million dollars or maybe it was 90 million but they i mean less than 100 million dollars and it made 400 million dollars so this thing you know in terms of of what was expected it made money and so horror movies lower budget or rated r like it just you know it's it's a good formula if the movie's good i mean look at nope look at um get out 
Uh, and so I guess this movie, it, it hit it. So sometimes horror movies are like, oh, this one hit it. $400 million from a, from a low budget or you know, pseudo low budget. This one is no surprise. The next one is Sonic 2. Sonic 2 only cost $90 million and made $400 million. This is the rare, this is the movie that broke, well, Sonic 1 broke the video game curse. Sonic 1 came out during the pandemic and it was way better than it should have been. The initial movie when it came out, like the initial trailer was horrible. Ugly Sonic, which is a thing, it's actually also referenced in the Rescue Rangers movie, which is hilarious. But Ugly Sonic was a more hyper-realistic, originally the design was a very realistic version of Sonic in this human world, and it was frightening. It was absolutely horrendous. And the, the backlash received was noted, and the director said, all right, we gotta make a fix. And there was a lot of people who had theories that they did this on purpose and that, you know, there's no way that they changed the design. Turns out that's not true. They really did alter the design and they actually hired a guy who put out like a fan edit and turns out he's a, you know, he, he, he works in that field and he was able to actually help craft um, the look for Sonic. So kudos to that guy. He's, he's now working for Paramount and doing his thing. So that's legit. They understood that the audience was not happy. They fixed it and that movie was amazing. And... It would have been horrible if Ugly Sonic was a thing. Because even though the film was great, that would have been a horrible distraction. It would have been really hard to see that hedgehog with, like, human teeth and just... Uh, anyway, so Sonic the Hedgehog was great. And they set up a sequel uh, with Tails showing up at the end. Spoiler alert. And Sonic 2 was amazing. Like, it shouldn't be as good as it was. Same thing with the first one. It shouldn't be as good. This one is more of a... I, I you know, I have some qualms with Sonic 1. Like, obviously the director knew certain things and they made that film um it, it's good it's really really good and the second one is even more on brand in the second one dr robotnik looks like dr robotnik the um the beginning uh, opening sequence with with sonic running through the city is a, almost a direct homage to the opening sequence in sonic adventure which is one of the most popular sonic games and it there's so many references the, the 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 layout of the movie, the environments they go to are referencing some of the uh, most of the levels and most of the, the stages in Sonic 2 and Sonic 3 and the music. I mean the, the guy's ringtone is one of the Sonic theme songs. like they are so on brand. They were so meticulous with the details that that also you know led to being a good movie. It meets the story beats. It, it's a superior sequel in every way and it's it, it sh it's it's far better than it has any right to be which is amazing i'm so glad that was a film idris elba did absolutely amazing as knuckles and i'm so i'm i am anxiously awaiting the series they announced that he's getting like his own spin-off series which i normally don't look forward to with like these things like it, everything doesn't need a spin-off but um one i was always a huge fan of knuckles and two idris elba freaking killed it so uh i'm looking forward to that my only uh concern would be in sonic 3 i hope that jim carrey does you know uh, comes out of retirement because he announced that he was just done with acting. I, I hope that that's not true, or at least he pauses until after Sonic 3 is completed because I, I really think he was a, a huge contributing factor to that. We got 90s Jim Carrey in this film, and he did awesome. And it was just in, in both movies. And so he really, really did it. And I I struggle to see how that film, uh, how, what an impact would be is like losing... Uh, that I, I don't know that you can replace Jim Carrey with somebody else that that would come off the same. Now you obviously would have to have a different character. It can't be Robotnik, but um, ultimately the, the villain is a, an important part of that. And so if you don't have something, somebody with as much charisma as Jim was bringing to it, I don't know that the third one will be as successful. It will be successful in its own right because it's going to have Shadow and it's probably going to have Metal Sonic as the, as a villain. And there's going to be other things, but and because the second one was so received so well, but I hope this doesn't hit um, the, the curse of the trilogy and that the third one just kind of drops the ball, which uh, I hope that Jim Carrey's a part of it. So that being said, moving on to the next one, Thor Love and Thunder. A lot of people, like, I've heard a lot of people complain about this movie. I loved it. Um, yeah, it was there were some jokes. Ultimately, Marvel Phase 4 is about, the theme is grief. And you feel that in this film. And it's hard to convey some of these things. Like, a lot of people don't realize that Thor Ragnarok was you know the tone was much lighter because of what you were experiencing 
in that film, his entire planet gets destroyed. All of his people, like all, all the Asgardians, are killed. Like there's so much, his father dies. There's not a lot that you could do in that film about like basically the genocide of the Asgardians without it being super depressing. So the tone allows you to deal with this concept in this way, and you see that carry over. Like Thor in in, in Infinity War is you know dealing with these things but he's kind of brushing it off like his his personality the whole bro thing the whole um his bravado is just a mask to cover the the things he's dealing with and then that comes full circle and um uh, it comes to a head in endgame where you see like his body is you know he's he's let himself fall he slipped he's become um depressed and he's um, given into that because that that's where his body now is reflecting what he was feeling internally and he's He's, you can see a person who's depressed. And so in Thor Love and Thunder, you're seeing the person that's trying to come out of that and trying to deal with grief. And in a way, these, him, his light tone is trying to process that. Like he's, he's not able to confront these things and this is a journey in that. So a lot of people felt like they didn't like it. I thought it was great. I think Christian Bale did a fantastic job. I think it set up a lot going forward with, you know, the Asgardian Afterlife. It introduced some new characters. It hit a lot of the beats. Um, my only complaint with the film, I think, is that um, I think Korg should have died. And not because I don't like Korg, but I think that would have set the stakes higher. I think that Korg's death would have really set the a precedent for that tone and um i also didn't like that valkyrie in the end didn't want to die like she's a valkyrie and previously she was like i want to die on the battlefield and that's what as guardians want to do so i didn't really find it um I, I it it made sense for the story for her not to go forward but i feel like that shouldn't have been the case i think Thor should have told her to sit it out or should have left without her knowing or you know something else but um her not wanting to die in battle just kind of seemed out of character but other than that it was great, and it definitely set up. It did. It did the same job of what a lot of these films have been doing in Phase Four. Is like taking the big players off the board. So Thor, at the end of the film, I won't spoil it, but there's something that happens in his life that basically keeps him preoccupied. So, you know, you you don't have these scenarios where everything on Earth is happening, and why didn't Thor show up? Because he's busy doing something else, and now we've established what that is. Um, so that made two hundred and fifty. It cost two hundred fifty million dollars and made $761 million. So regardless of what anybody thinks about, you know, like, oh, I know Marvel Face 4 dropped the ball, Thor Love and Thunder made money. And that's that's it. It made money, made more than what was put in. Uh, the next one on the list is Wakanda Forever, another one in the Phase 4 grief. Um, this movie suffered because it had to be changed storyline-wise because of Chadwick Boseman. However, um, one thing that if you've seen the movie, the director came out and said that... Uh, Ryan Coogler said that originally um, it was going to be the same theme. Most of the story was a lot of the same thing, except it was T'Challa was going to come back after having been snapped and find out that he has, um, you know, he has things that he has to deal with. He has a, a son that he didn't know he had, and he has to deal with not being around for five years and and reconciling what what has happened in the time that he was gone. And so it still would have been an exercise in grief. It just would have been from the perspective of T'Challa. And instead, that switched because obviously the untimely passing of Chadwick Boseman um, in 2020, they instead shifted the perspective to Shuri and allowed her to process grief, which is in in a way, it's so beautiful because it, it it's an exercise in grief. It's allowing it's it's a film that's about grief, and it's also it's it's a superhero movie that doesn't have its titular character, doesn't have its superhero, and instead becomes um, an homage to him or um, a story about Chadwick Boseman and not just T'Challa. And the way his death is handled in the film is very respectful and and also reminiscent of his real life ailment and also in how it came, like it was just unknown and. It was just very, just amazing. I loved it. I thought it was absolutely fantastic way to close out Phase 4. I loved it as a film. Um, I loved Namor's representation. Like, it's hard for me. Like, there's not a lot. We talk about this a lot in terms of Latin um, representation on film. And Namor uh, was just done exquisitely. Like, the Akukukan, like, this dude did it, man. Tana Huerta did the job, and... I love the way that the, the, the Talokan people are represented in this film. I love the way that, um, that everything is just done in this film. Like the, it's just amazing. I could talk about this forever, but I'm, I'm going to, let's get into detail. The way that the, you know, the, the, 
the Talokan people were like as an indigenous representation. I've never on film seen the, I guess like the colonization of Latin Americans of the of the Native American people, the natives to South America and and North America, or, or you know the Caribbean peoples and uh, the mestizos and the Mesoamericans. I've never seen that depicted where the you know in with the Spanish you know, conquistadors and 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 the colonization. It's not something that's particularly shown a lot and so having that displayed here and then tying it to to namor's to his origin and and to his name uh, the el niño sin amor and the, the boy without love and that's how he it becomes it's not namor it's namor like it, absolutely fantastic man i felt so great when i when i saw black panther the first time i left and i was uh, me me and my wife were like sitting over here like i wanted to go to wakanda i was like damn this is amazing and I've gone through Ancestry recently and uh, over the last couple of years, and I've found, you know, a, a lot of the, you know, Latin Americans, depending on where you come from, there's a, there's a mixtures. And so being Puerto Rican, I have uh, European, uh, African, and Native American uh, blood. And so uh, th- I have a lot more African blood than, than I had initially thought. And that changed my perspective. Now, I have um, like knowledge of the areas where that that African that DNA comes from uh, Senegal, Mali, um, and um, I'm trying to think of Cam- Cameroon, and that gave me a, a strong desire. I want to visit these places. I want to you know learn about these cultures, and so I've been diving into those. It's not just you know just the Spanish culture. It's not just this you know European specific culture. And I learned that I'm you know I have Portuguese DNA, and so I've been learning a little bit about you know Portugal and Portuguese, and which still ends up being the same thing. But this new you know being tied to this other continent, being tied to to you know the African continent, and learning these things, and that opened up something else and so seeing Wakanda I was like wow man this is amazing and I would oh it was I I loved the style the way the designs like everything I was like this is a fantastic then to see that replicated and it happens again like I I dug the the, you know the style the way that people dress like the the whole vibe that the first Black Panther gave off and then here Wakanda Forever does it again in addition to Wakanda and like also the 90s feel with some of the outfits um but then Talokan is just dope. Like as soon as the music came on, you're seeing these people underwater. Like you know, my my wife's fascinated with mermaids, and just seeing all that. Like there's there's so much to it. Instead of it just being a carbon copy of Atlantis from from Aquaman, they put this different spin, and the clothing that they wear, and the colors, and the way that they speak, and it was just like man, that's that's it. Like I was like, I want to get a Namor costume. I want to like. You know, I, I started learning about Aztecs and, and Mayans. Like, I never knew those things. I never concerned me as much because I, I always identified more with, like, you know, the, the Taino and learning that. But now I'm discovering all these other aspects. And then, you know, my, my wife's Mexican and then my, my kids are, are part Mexican. So, like, learning these things, it's, it's so important now. And it just added so much depth to that film. So a lot of other people might not feel the same way, but I felt this major depth in this movie and I thought it was really really great so I can't speak about that enough it's one of my favorites of the year and it it made a lot of money 250 million dollar budget to a 789 million dollar return um and then you know it hasn't even gone on Disney plus yet so that's it's it's gonna see some returns the next one on the list is oh my god I did not it's a sleeper like when I say sleeper we all knew it was gonna be good but this movie did oh my god the Batman 185 million dollars spent and 770 million dollar return this movie was amazing the soundtrack was fantastic the score the batman theme felt like every other theme all homaged it was all referencing the danny elfman score the um the the dark knight hans zimmer score like all of it was just referenced in um in in the music it was just Oh my God, I cannot even express how amazing the music was. And then the film itself, this is the first Batman movie that's actually a detective story. And he did stellar. The whole cast did amazing. Um, the difference, like putting a different spin on, on, on Riddler and actually making him um, threatening and you know, uh, Colin Farrell as the Penguin just disappeared in that role. Like, that's not Colin Farrell.
just feels like a matchbox city where no one really lives in there. It's just, just these characters. And it feels very Burton-esque, but almost too much, even though I love Batman Returns, um, even more than the first Batman. And then you have, you know, like Joel Schumacher's versions where those cities are complete neon and they don't feel real at all. It feels completely exaggerated. And in the Dark Knight series with, you know, um, and, and Batman Begins, Gotham feels like a real city, but like a real city. You know, it feels like Chicago or it feels like New York. And it, it, that's how those films meant it to be portrayed. This Gotham is Gotham. It doesn't feel like it's another city. It's not trying to be another city. Like that is ripped straight out of the comic book, if, if not even more so ripped straight out of the Arkham games. Like that is Gotham. That movie, oh my God, I cannot, I cannot wait for part two. And I, I really hope that um, that scene that they released with the Joker, I hope, I, I think they should have left that in the movie. And uh, if you haven't seen it, Google it. There's a, uh, a deleted scene with um, Barry Keegan playing um, the Joker, and it is terrifying. Like, that Joker looks terrifying, and I cannot wait to see what they do with that. Um, and then they got the series coming out, um, you know, with a Colin Farrell series. I, I don't know if the GCPD one with uh, Commissioner Gordon got canceled, but I know that the Penguin series is coming out. But there's a lot of shakeups going on at DC, and we'll get to that later because that's big. Um, but Doctor Strange, Doctor Strange, the Multiverse of Madness, Marvel's first horror movie, uh, $200 million budget, $955 million. A Doctor Strange movie almost made a billion dollars. So, listen, it, it's it's great. I mean, the director was, this, you know, Sam Raimi, so he, he did his thing. I think that they could have done a little bit more with the whole, you know, multiverse aspect, but that movie was fantastic. I thought it was great. I loved it. Um, and again, it was super creepy in the right ways. It really established, and it did what, like I said, it got these two major players, Doctor Strange and um, the Scarlet Witch, off the board for a little bit, so that way it makes sense why things are happening in the, in the universe. Well, I can't wait to see the team up later. Now, um, Minions, The Rise of Gru, that movie only cost, like, I think $80 million, and it made $955 million. So that just shows people love the freaking Minions, and, uh, you know, it, it just, it's just what it is, you know. Da -ba -da -da, those little creepy little things. So anyway, that made a lot of freaking money. That's uh, it goes without saying. Those things are gonna probably keep doing that. So Universal, keep doing your thing. Um, Jurassic World Dominion actually made a lot of money. I'm really shocked by that because I I don't know anybody that saw it and uh, oh, my son saw it. But like you know he liked it. He likes Jurassic Park. He likes all stuff. But like a lot of people I spoke to, they you know either really didn't dig it or they didn't see it. So I'm surprised. A hundred a hundred eighty five million dollar budget and one billion dollar return. So, needless to say, they're making another one. No matter what you think that this is the end, they're making another one. Um, so I won't get into detail on that because I, I really didn't see it, so I can't judge the film. Um, Avatar. Like, this one's high up on the list. This is number two on the list for highest grossing films. And it, it just came out. So $350 million budget, which who knows if it was actually more than that, considering they filmed all these other films together. Because um, they have like four more coming out or three more coming out. So it made a billion dollars. It's and it's still in the movie theater, so it it might. Well, I guess it won't. It can't now because you know we're already in 2023. But it it, it could have gotten close to surpassing the other one. But at the time, um, you know, in terms of 2022 successes, like it, it might make more money. You know, after you know, because it's it's still in theater, so it might end up making more money than the the movie that's the currently the top list. But again, we're just only keeping this in 2022. So Avatar, 350 million dollar budget, one billion dollar return. And I mean, I guess I've heard it's better. I, I, I'm assuming that you're supposed to see this movie in the theaters because of the technology and like that—that's the way to see it. But I, I don't, I don't know that I have any desire to watch it. I, I feel like now I'm obligated to do it, but eh, we'll see. The number one film before we get there, let's do some honorable mentions. Bad Guys did really well. It's on Netflix now. It's an animated movie. Sam Rockwell, love Sam Rockwell, based on the kids' book. Elvis, Elvis did pretty good. Um, surprisingly, Uncharted did well. So I guess now that the movie, the video game movie Curse is Broken, uh, Uncharted did well, even though I kind of still think the movie would have done better if Mark Wahlberg had played, you know, the, the main character instead of Tom Holland. But I guess they're trying to give him more mature roles. But anyway, uh, you know, I, I didn't play the game. So I'm, I'm, I'm only speaking from having, you know, uh, seen this in... in like, I guess like third party, like or, or just kind of like a, a skewed perspective. So I, I won't get into much of that. Nope, nope did great. I mean, is that surprising? Jordan Peele, this guy has been knocking it out the park, man. Everything. If you haven't seen Wendell and Wild, 
on Netflix. It's uh, Jordan Peele and Keegan Michael Key doing um, working with um, God. I, I'm so upset that I can't remember his name, but the director of Nightmare Before Christmas because everybody thinks that Tim Burton directed it. Tim Burton produced it. The actual director is um, has done. Uh, he did Coraline, and he's got that great style. So this is the guy that actually made. Um, the Nightmare Before Christmas and Coraline, and he made this film called Wendell and Wild, and basically these two guys play like I don't know, like uh, demons, and and it's it's super creepy and so good, like so good with the stop motion animation, like absolutely fantastic, and, and and like it's a diverse film, and not for the sake of diversity, like it just feels like it exists in, in a in in a modern time, and it, it just it's dope, man. If you haven't checked it out, check it out. So I love everything that Jordan Peele does. Um, Bullet Train. I haven't seen it yet, but my boy Bad Bunny's in it, and Brad Pitt crushes it, and the cast is stellar. The the trailers look amazing, so I need to watch this thing, but it made good money. Um, And um, everything, everywhere, all at once. Like, this movie is not only uh, financially successful, it's been critically successful. Like, this, they say that this movie did more for the multiverse than Multiverse of Madness did. Like, this film is fantastic. Not only does it play with the concepts of uh, the multiverse and what does that mean? What, what does it mean for an individual? But I mean, I've heard nothing but amazing things about that film. So if you haven't seen it, check it out. I, it's on my list. I haven't seen it yet, but it looks fire. Um, and then Dragon Ball Super Superhero. I need to talk about this on a totally separate video because I am a huge, huge, huge Dragon Ball fan and and a fan of anime. But this movie surprised me because um, Broly was amazing. And Broly broke records as like the highest grossing anime film of all time. That now initially I had I was apprehensive because the the film took some instead of being classically animated with hand drawn animation, it went with computer generated images, which stands to like it looks so good like it's not distracting like it looks like it's going to be and then you're watching it like oh crap it looks so good. And it also means that we're probably going to get a lot more content in the future because now they've created these assets, it's going to be cheaper for them to manipulate them because hand-drawn animation is expensive. So they'll be able to do a whole lot more with this, and this movie didn't cost that much and broke records. So there is a whole lot more Dragon Ball content coming in the future, and I am here for it because that film did so much. And I, again, I, I'm could go off on a tangent but i want to dedicate some time to talk about dragon ball separately because it's just amazing if you haven't seen it it's great and it, it, it does some great things again I'm gonna, I'm gonna avoid going off on that tangent and the number one film of 2022 in terms of box office was top gun maverick for a 170 million dollar budget with a 1.4 billion dollar return now a lot of that has to do with May, may not say a lot. Some of it has to do with nostalgia. A lot of it has to do with what I mentioned earlier. Tom Cruise, he can sell a movie just on his on on his name. Also, the guy is when it comes to stunts, he's doing his own stunts and he's breaking the mold and setting the standard for what it means to be a movie star. This guy's not an actor. He's a he's a movie star. He is doing stunts. He is pushing the envelope. And in addition to the fact that they were like filming in these. Uh, let's just go ahead and say it. The, the U.S. government bought, paid for these uh, these these you know uh, these fighter jets that were never going to fly or, or that were never going to really use in combat. And so he made more use of it than the government's ever going to make use of it in the next thirty years. So cool for you for making that relevant and for making it. You know, uh, some people would have thought this movie was going to be a propaganda, uh, like a propaganda film for America. And like that's how Top Gun, the first one, is sort of seen like this American propaganda film. But no, this just, uh, from everyone I've heard, it's just a good flick. It's a good movie. Like, uh, I, I was told to take my wife they, and I, from friends of mine that know that uh, they're not Tom Cruise fans. And they were like, you have to see this movie. And I was like, really? I was impressed. Like, oh, wow, this is, that, that's quite an endorsement. So um, the film ultimately is thematically about the movie experience. It's about the conflict between you know, on an under level about streaming versus cinema, about what that looks like. It's presented in a way that you have to see this for the maximum amount of the experience on the big screen. And that's underlying what the story is about. So the story yeah, is about these, you know, fighter pilots and all that stuff, but it there's an underlying element. It's a metaphor for 
you know, the film industry. And that also in itself contributed to this movie's success in addition to, to these other things. So it, it was a movie that was made to tell you to get back into the theater and it did the job. It absolutely did it. So full credit where credit is due, Top Gun Maverick is the 2022 movie of the year, which is, I can't believe I'm saying that out loud, but it's true. Now, um, let's talk about some other things like TV shows and, I mean, there is so much that happened in 2022. I mean, in terms of the music industry, who would have been able to predict that uh, Kanye West, <laughs> yay, the guy who said on TV during the uh, it was a Hurricane Katrina, um, during the Hurricane Katrina, like I said, it was raising funds for, for, for Hurricane Katrina, on national television during this, this fundraiser, like on live TV, uh, he says, George Bush hates black people. And if you ever go on YouTube and type that in and look at like Mike Myers' face when he says it, it's, it's, it's oh my God, it's so hard to watch. But who would have predicted that this guy who said that would go full-blown Nazi? And not, I'm not saying that, you know, like, like I'm not being, it's not a hyperbolic statement. I'm, that's not hyperbole. He claimed himself that he loves Nazis and that he hates, he hates Jews and that Hitler was awesome and that he loves Hitler. So who would have predicted that? in 2022 that a presidential because he's announced that he's running for president that a presidential candidate would be an open nazi and and then just fall from grace this guy came out and said that he said he could say anti-semitic things and that adidas couldn't drop him that he had it like that and then they dropped him like this guy's fall from grace has been i mean unprecedented like i've never seen something like this collapse in this manner so 2022 has been really interesting for things i mean you've seen the in, in terms of politics and world events you uh russia invaded the ukraine like the the political geopolitical landscape has been shaken up um donald trump who was you know previously the 45th president of the united states of america and had one of the most stellar rises in in political history it, it can't he's completely unviable as a candidate he announced his candidacy and no one cared like Ron DeSantis is polling you know much better than him so much to the point that his his camp is concerned that he might not win a, a primary against uh, DeSantis to get the nomination and instead of losing he's threatening to run third party instead of running in a primary because it, it's possible that it'll lose, so they're threatening to run third party and split the Republican Party. Like, what the hell is going on? Um, there's a massive rise in anti-Semitism in the United States of America. Like, this, it's concerning. It's concerning. So 2022 was um, was was harsh. Like, um, I, I can't say that there was a whole lot in terms of music that um, that stood out. There was a there was there was not a lot in terms of of shaking up of things. Like, there was. Um, a, a general sense of, of of lackluster, like the the economy went down, the um, the stock markets tank, crypto. Like I, I've been a huge proponent of crypto. I think that that it has value. There's a lot of scams out there, but I think that cryptocurrency as a you know the blockchain has value, and I believe that um, there's a lot of in the technology. There's a lot that is significant. The Dogecoin, I think, uh, you know, there's there's utility in in this in this technology, and unfortunately the market was decimated is it is it going away completely absolutely not like i think it'll recover and anybody who's smart will invest appropriately but this is what happens with bubbles it happened with the dot-com bubble it happened with the real estate bubble and it looks like we're also heading to another real estate bubble like um rent prices are out of control um housing prices are out of control you're you're looking up of like like a 30 percent markup in, in florida florida has become the fastest growing state in the united states um lakeland florida um, a town in central outside of Tampa and Orlando has become like the third largest growing city or fastest growing um, city in, in in the country. Like what is happening? Um, <laughs> it, it, it seems like there's so much going on. Um, and I, I spoke to people, I, I have a lot of family who live in New York and a lot of those folks were telling me about um, how they just now are experiencing, um, you know, in-person gatherings or rather like, you know, for Christmas, like big events in person um, because there, there's 
there was still such a stigma in, in New York in terms of people still getting COVID. And it's different because the environment's so compact and people are so um, enclosed and, and close together. It, it's a completely different environment. So in other places, a lot of people went back to, to quote unquote normal, um, you know, in relative ease or, or, or much faster. Whereas I still know folks who this has been their first holiday season that they've seen people in person since the lockdowns in 2020. So that's significant. And um, it, it it's very interesting how that dynamic is different than everywhere else in the country. So New York is just a special pocket that things are, are different. So um, I find it very, very um, intriguing. And I feel sorry for those folks. And I think that there was a lot going on this year and that it prevented this you know, going forward. Like there's been a lot of, you know, is it going here? Is it going there? Like this general sense of we don't really feel like we're moving, progressing towards something positive. I, a, a lot of people just say that the vibe is off. That's what I'm saying. 2022, the vibe was off. And I'm not going to end that on a sour, sour note. I really think that 2023 is going to be better. I really, really do. We have so much to look forward to. We're getting started with, you know, let's talk about movies again. Marvel Phase 5. Um, like, Phase 5 is officially kicking off. It's kicking off with Ant-Man and the Wasp, which comes out in February. We're going to get some tie-ins to stuff. you got, you know, Loki Season 2. You've got, you know, the Marvels. you got, you know, potentially the X-Men showing up. With Now I'm hearing uh, uh, Fighting the Eternals. Like, y- there's rumors right now that... Um, and again, that's from credible sources, that Robert Downey Jr. and uh, Scarlett Johansson are going to reprise their characters in not only like, some other films, um, like Ar- Armor Wars, but, um, but Secret Wars. And you know, Deadpool 3 is going to have Hugh Jackman and, and that version of Wolverine, so it's more than likely that he's going to show up in Avengers Secret Wars. So Avengers Secret Wars is shaping up to look like the most massive superhero movie ever, which... You know, you could already say that, you know, uh, Infinity War and Endgame were, were that. This looks to be topping that um, with, you know, older super. I mean, maybe we'll get Wesley Snipes' Blade. Maybe we'll get, you know, uh, <laughs> the original X-Men next to the Avengers. And, and I would love to see, you know, all the lineup of the original Avengers, you know, come back. And, and I think that that's what happened. It's not going to undo their deaths. I, I called that a long time ago. I think they're going to be alternate, like, variants. And that's what we're going to experience. That we'll be able to get these characters, but not undo their arcs. And the same thing with Wolverine. So, that's going to be, you know, that's billion dollar box office right there. Like, and they're building to it. And so, you know, Marvel, I think, is going to, they, they, they've been doing it for a while. And uh, this, this is a step in the right direction. Um, unfortunately, the, the opposite goes for for DC. DC is uh, the DCEU is officially dead. Um, Black Adam didn't kill it. Um, James Gunn being hired. And I won't say he killed it either because I know that he has a job to do and he's being brought in. Um, I, I really just wish that we would have got one last, I guess, quote unquote, Snyderverse film um, as a send off for these characters rather than just rebooting. Um, they should have ended it with in-house, you know, Final Crisis or Kingdom Come film. Something with all of these characters that we're saying goodbye to Henry Cavill, Ben Affleck, Jason Momoa, Gal Gadot. Um, and unfortunately, Ezra Miller makes that difficult because he's going through some significant things. But, um, if you were to just get that one send off with these characters, um, it wouldn't have been that hard to to to, uh, to understand the reboot. So now, when you know DC eventually reboots and they make announcements sometime later this month on what films are coming out, it's 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 going to be a hard transition. And I, I'm hoping that you know it's good, but um, it's gonna it's gonna be difficult to just move on without getting the closure on that other end. I really think that they should have did a closeout film for that universe and did an in-house reboot like Days of Future Past or how Star Trek kind of did an alternate timeline. Like do something in-house, man. Don't don't just like reboot it because that's it's gonna feel depressing and people are gonna feel it in real life. And DC was already struggling, so that's that's my opinion on that, which is where I was talking about with Black Adam. It's unfortunate that they they brought in Henry Cavill for a for a. Um, <laughs> basically a cameo and announced that he was returning as Superman and then they were like, nah, never mind, I'm not doing that. So <laughs> so the DCEU died and uh, Marvel lives on. And so we'll see what happens in the future, but um, you know, I'm, I'm going to give James Gunn a shot, but again, I, I just really wish, I, I think that it would have been much better to have one closeout film, just one massive, you know, kill everybody, whatever, do something, but like, you know, they should have just been one last thing, one, one last final crisis or something. Anyway, um, and so, you know, we've got a lot coming up. Um, Stranger Things 4 or 5, 
uh, four, I think it was. So Stranger Things season four was out um, earlier this year. Amazing. Um, I, I, I mean, the <laughs> the pop culture references that came from that, like Wednesday is a huge hit. If you haven't seen the Wednesday, um, the Tim Burton uh, Adams Family pseudo spinoff about Wednesday Adams on, um, and, and it's, 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 it's fantastic. My kids are, um, watching them <laughs> YouTube clips of Wednesday Adams dancing every damn day. So, you know, there's been a lot of good content that came out. Um, I, again, I feel somewhat saddened because, um, I, I'm very strong into music and I, I feel like the best album of the year, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. The best album of the year was the weekend's album. Um, the Dawn FM. Like, it just, it's just amazing. Like, it absolutely captures its concept. It's a, a the concept of death and um, that, and just think about the metaphor of life being a party and then at the end you don't want to leave the party but you have to go and, like, staying too long at a party. Like, it, it, it's just phenomenal. If you haven't heard the album, listen to the entire thing. It's incredible. But other than that, I, I really can't say too much about, about music this year. I, I'd, and maybe that's just because I just uh, didn't really feel it. But that album felt just spot on. It really did. Um, and then in terms of films and TV shows, there's been, there's been a lot this year that are, that are good. Um, I, I can't even go down the list. We're going to have to come back to that another time because there's just so much. And um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm missing my, my co-host's. Um, I was uh, the reintroduction of my co-host Mimi. Um, we uh, we were gonna bring something out, but unfortunately, we got to tackle things. We got kids, so one of us is tackling what the other one. So, I'm hoping that we uh, we bring that together later on, and we can discuss some of the other things that I that I <laughs> that I might have missed. So, uh, hopefully, you guys aren't too bored just hearing what I'm talking about because I've just been going off on tangents. But ultimately, I'd like to give my overall critique of. Um, of 2022 um it sucked i'm glad it's gone and let's move forward 2023 baby yeah so um i'm good i think 2023 is going to be good uh because if it's worse than 2022 jesus christ how's that even possible um this year was trash absolute dumpster fire so let's move on that's it enjoy happy new year um i hope you got to celebrate with uh, loved ones and uh, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to this year. Let's make it a good one. We're starting. And um, I, did, I didn't have a New Year's resolution this year. I'm just going to be honest. Um, I d- couldn't really think of it. I, I tried. Couldn't think of anything. I, um, it just was, was one of those years. Like, it's one of those. There's several things. I guess it's just how 2022 is that, you know, you often would make the joke. Like, uh, talk to somebody you know, on December 31st and then talk to them again on January. Be like, oh, I haven't talked to you since last year and these corny little dad jokes and all kind of... I didn't have time for any of that. Um, I, I Literally, after the ball dropped, I was like, all right, time to go home. Like, um, I really just wanted to put 2022 in the rearview mirror and let's make 2023 great. Let's Let's do this. Let's actually put this together. Let's tell the people that you care about that you love them. Call up the people not they don't just text them call them uh talk to someone physically go and meet up with someone and tell tell them you love them tell them you care tell them you miss them um let's encourage each other and let's get better and i'm not talking about toxic positivity constructive criticism is good too but let's be there for each other like actually be there let's be more empathetic towards each other let's be more mindful of each other's mental health let's be more mindful and more community focused let's all be better in 2023 so that 2023 can be better to all of us and uh, thank you for listening and I, I if you're still here uh, congratulations you are winning the endurance race you were able to tolerate my voice for more than 45 minutes so thank you and uh, see you in the next one again catch us on youtube catch me on uh, catch me outside uh, <laughs> no but uh, yeah latin experience i'm not gonna do this every time